tells the Confederate story, but not the way that it's being told these days. Um, I have asked more than 5,000 people, mostly teachers, uh, around the U.S. for about the last six or seven years, why did the South secede? I always get four answers. I get they seceded for slavery, for states' rights, because of the election of Lincoln, or tariffs and taxes, or arguments about the same. And then I ask these teachers to vote. And overwhelmingly, whether I am asking in North Carolina, where I did it first, or in northern Minnesota, where I happen to do it second, or in North Dakota, where I've done it, or an overall overwhelmingly black audience in Memphis, or central Florida, or Cleveland, or southern California, always states' rights wins a clear majority, about 60 to 70 percent of my, of my huge audiences of teachers say hmm. states' rights. Now, what's the matter with that? Well, it's completely false is what's the matter with it. As the southern states leave the Union, and that's why this is called a reader, because it includes what they say as they leave the Union, uh, South Carolina first and then each one says, we are upset with states' rights. We are seceding because we are mad at some states and the rights they're trying to um, manifest. For instance, Pennsylvania. Free states? Yeah. Free states. Pennsylvania, for instance, is messing around with the Fugitive Slave Act a little bit. They say, we know it's a national act, we can't do anything about it. But um, we can, and then they proceed to do little things, like they pass a law saying, we know that our gendarmes, our state police, our deputy sheriffs and so on, that they have the job of tracking down any escaped slave and stuff. You do what you have to under this bill, but we're not paying you for that time. All right. This totally upsets South Carolina. South Carolina is upset by New York because New York no, no longer allows what's called slavery transit or temporary slavery. It used to be, for instance, the, the nice white folks from Charleston didn't want to spend August in Charleston. I understand that having done it recently. Uh, so they'd rather go to New York City and see some plays. Mm -hmm. But they'd like to bring their cook along. And New York now says, uh-uh. If you bring your enslaved cook into New York, we're trying to run a free state. She becomes free. South Carolina is outraged about this. It's one of the reasons she secedes. Well, that was the basis of the Dred Scott decision. The Dred Scott went up to Minnesota yes. with his master. And exactly. When, and, and when he came back down south, he said, hey, wait a minute. I was in a exactly. free state. I'm free now. Yeah. And, and so the issue uh, here, well, that was trickier because Minnesota, I think, was a territory then. Yes. Uh, there's no question that New York does have the right to do this within. They're even mad at New Hampshire because New Hampshire lets blacks vote. Now, who the heck votes in America is the state's right at this point. It's not until the 15th Amendment that you mentioned earlier, passed two whole eras later and during Reconstruction, right. that it becomes a national matter. So what business is it of South Carolina's? Well, they make it their business using the Dred Scott as an example. They, they say, look, we've got this law, this decision that says black folks have no rights a white person needs to respect, and here you New Hampshireans are letting them vote. This is an outrage. We've had enough. We're seceding. So though they're seceding against states' rights and totally about slavery. Yeah. And yet, most teachers teach it exactly backward, which really shows the power of neo-Confederates. That's why the book is called The Confederate and Neo-Confederate Reader. Um, right now, the in, new in 2012. The, the reinvention. It's interesting. I, I grew up in Michigan, and I learned as a child in school that the South seceded in large part to protect slavery, but also to protect an agrarian way of life, you know, cotton and whatnot, and the North was industrializing. My children grew up in Atlanta, and in public schools, they learned that the South seceded because the Northern bankers were ripping off the Southern plantation oh, arms. <laughs> and more BS. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's just, it's really quite remarkable. Um, Sundown Towns. One of your books is, is yeah. about sundown towns. Uh, we, we have about that's, three minutes here. I'd like to get into it. I, I, I don't want to miss that. Is. Okay. Yes, please. A sundown town is a town that's all white on purpose. Mm. All right. Uh, they get their name. I, I need to say that a lot of towns are all white on purpose in, for instance, Pennsylvania or in Maryland. But the term isn't used much east of Ohio. Uh, but nevertheless, they're sundown towns. Uh, the, the name comes from places like, for instance, Manitowoc, Wisconsin, which up until the 19, late 1960s, or maybe even 1970, had a sign at its city limits saying, nigger, don't let the sun go down on you in Manitowoc. Same sign in Hawthorne, California. Same sign in Pekin, Illinois. And you don't have to have a sign, as I mentioned. When I went to write this book, having I grew up in the, the middle of Illinois, as I mentioned earlier, I knew I was going to do more research in Illinois than any other single state. I thought I would end up with maybe 10 sundown towns in Illinois, maybe 50 across the country. 
I had no well, idea. They had these signs of the N word on them. Well, it's... they don't always have to have the sign, as I said. Yeah. Uh, but but they can have. A, they, they think they. Pa Several towns, for instance, actually sounded a whistle at 6 p.m. In fact, some still sound it as we speak to tell blacks to be gone. Now, they will deny, wow. some people will deny that that's the purpose. They're just saying, well, it's the 6 o'clock whistle. But if you interview folks in the town, they say, yeah, well, that's what that whistle means. Well, you wouldn't want to be a black person, a black resident in that town at 6.01. I right. mean, you really wouldn't. So it can be a whistle. It can be just a, a known fact, you know. Uh, Often there was no, not even an ordinance, but the city police would still enforce it. And this it. is still with us. There are still many. I was in a county in Illinois three years ago, just as Barack Obama was taking office. This was January three years ago. This county, Calhoun County, is north of St. Louis, voted for Obama 52-46, just as did the United States, same percentage. Right. Uh, and no black household has lived there for decades. There's been repeated stories of people who have been, black people who have been hanged for being there after dark and so on. I asked a, a good person, uh, a person of goodwill, I said, do you think a black family could move here today? And she said, I really don't think so. She said, maybe if Obama works some miracles, maybe in three or four years, but not now. Well, that's an example. What, uh, what do we do about this? Well, I have two, two suggestions. First, I want to out them all. And so if any of your viewers know of a Sun Downtown, email me about it. Okay. J. Lowen, J-L-O-E-W-E-N, at U-V-M. I still get my email at the University of Vermont.edu. I'd love to hear from you. They're at my website. Uh, that is, the ones I know about. So that's the first step towards healing, to admit it. Uh, and then the second thing is, um, I think we have to make cause with the good people in the lots most of the folks aren't in favor of this but if you have a two percent thug minority that thinks this is the right thing to do to throw a brick through their window if they move in or to beat up their kids at school then the family almost has to leave and then i do have a third proposal and that is i actually think that uh white households in sundown towns or sundown counties should lose their home their homestead interest mortgage interest deduction from their income tax okay and if, as soon as that happened then suddenly they'd want to write, they, they find a black householder dr james lowen thank you so much for being with us tonight. sure it's been it's been an honor my very first full-time teaching job was at tougaloo college that's t-o-u-g-a it's not a very well-known college up here in in uh, washington dc but it's a good college um very good and it's in mississippi and it's african-american so I'm teaching the courses I expected to be teaching in sociology, but I'm also pressed into, ter into service to teach one section of a course called the Freshman Social Science Seminar. So this was a course that had been invented by the history department, in fact, and it was a required course, and it introduced students to, you know, the drill, psych, poli sci, econ, social, et cetera. And it did this in the context of African-American history. It made sense, 99% of our students be an African-American. Well, that's the same chronology as, shall we say, regular American history. So second semester begins not only right after Christmas, uh, it also begins right after the Civil War. So second semester begins, I have a new group of 17 students that first day of class. I don't want to do all that talk, all the talking that first day. So I ask my students, okay, um, what, what happened during Reconstruction right after the Civil War? What, 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 what went on there? And my, what happened to me was an aha reaction, or I might better call it an oh no reaction, because my, 16 out of my 17 students said to me, that's the time when, right after the Civil War, Reconstruction, uh, blacks took over the government of the southern states. But they were too soon out of slavery, and so they screwed up, and white folks had to take control this is again. Birth of a Nation, the, exactly. the 1903 exactly. movie, as yeah. I recall. Yeah, uh, Birth the of became... a Nation, Gone with the Wind, yeah. uh, all rolled into one. And, of course, these are all African-American students. Um, I thought, my gosh, what must it do to you to believe that the one time your group was center stage in American history, they screwed up? Now, it'd be a different matter if this happened, uh, but it didn't happen. Uh, this is, in fact, what we in sociology call BS history.